Good day, everyone. I am Dr. Erwin Martinez Valier, a professor of Pharmacy Department, San Pedro College, and also the visiting professor of Bournemouth University, United Kingdom. Welcome to our first topic on the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical industry in the Philippines, an overview. This will be the first topic then of the pharmaceutical marketing and entrepreneurship. Our learning objective for today is all about to explain the healthcare system in the Philippines, define the pharmaceutical marketing in the context of the Philippine setting, and to identify the pharmaceutical industries in the Philippines. So let us try to define first some of the terminologies about marketing so that it will not confuse us. First, about marketing. So mark, according to different uh, terminologies, and of course it's defined by Oxford Dictionaries, Number one would be marketing is the action or business of promoting and selling products or services, including market research and advertising. According to the American Marketing Association in 2017, marketing is the activity set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, and delivering and exchanging offerings that have a value for customers, clients, partners, and society at large. According to Dr. Philip Kotler, he mentioned that marketing as the science and art of exploring, creating, and delivering value to satisfy the need of a target market at a profit. Market, marketing identifies unfulfilled needs and desires. It also defined as a measures and quantifies the size of the identified market and the profit potential. It also pinpoints which segments the company is capable of serving best and it defines and promotes the appropriate product and of course services. Another definition according to Julie Bar Barley, the vice president of e-commerce Fairway Market, she defined marketing as a traditionally the means by which an organization com communicates to connect with and engage its target audience to convey the value of and ultimately sell its products and services. However, since the emergence of di digital media, in particular social media and technology innovation, it has increasingly become more about companies building deeper, more meaningful, and lasting relationship with the people that they want to buy their product and services. The ever increasingly fragmented world of media complicates market, marketers' ability to connect to connect and at the same time, time to present incredible opportunities to forge new territory. So that is according to the definition of Judy Barley. So now let us move on to the introduction about the Philippine economy. As of 2017, the population of the Philippines was almost 100,000 uh, million, okay, 100 million, according to the Philippine Statistic Authority. And of course, uh, within 2045, it will actually increase into 142 million with rapidly changing demographics, the population age of 65 uh, years old and over may quadruple in the size to 16 million by 2045. Uh, that is according to the Philippine Statistics Authority in 2016. The country actually witnessed economic growth of 6.7 a percent of GDP in 2017 and an annual average growth rate of 6% over the past five years that is according to Banco Central of Filipinas in 2017. The projected average life expectancy at the birth will increase from 70.38 years that is a male 60, 67 and female of 73 from 2010 to 2015, 2015 to 75.68 years. That is increasing into 2035. 
So now, what is all about in the Philippine economy? As we all know, that the gross domestic product of the Philippines was worth 355.50 billion, uh, billion no? in 2099. That is in U.S. dollars. Uh, according to the official data from the World Bank and projection from the trading economics. The GDP value of the Philippines represents around 0.29% of the world economy. So it's actually increasing as you go along to the Philippine uh, economy. Now, what is then with regards to the top 10 leading cause of debt? Now, in the top 10 leading cause of debt, according to the Philippine Statistic Authority in 2018, uh, according in 2016, there are six out of 10 leading causes of death were the non-communicable diseases in etiology. Most of them of the non-communicable diseases mortality cases such as ischemic heart disease, cancer, okay, diabetes, and others that are shown in your table number one. Okay that are considered lifestyle-related, that is according to the Philippine Statistic Authority in 2018. That is quite very alarming. Why? Because there is an increasing prevalence of obesity among children and adolescents that are risk factors for non-communicable diseases. In table number one, in the top 10 leading cause of death, it also mentioned about the highlights of infectious diseases as one of the leading causes of morbidity, according to the Philippine Statistics Authority in 2018. Despite campaigning by the Department of Health and funding agencies, tuberculosis still remained the leading cause of mortality and morbidity in the country, that is according to the Department of Health. HIV, or, uh, HIV cases are less than 1%, that is according to the Department of Health in 2010. It is very alarming then that we have also other causes of death. We have also pneumonia, cerebrovascular diseases, hypertensive diseases, diabetes mellitus, and other heart disease, respiratory tuberculosis, chronic lower respiratory infection, and other genital urinary system and other cause of death. Now, what are the risk factors affecting the health status? In 2016, uh, we have mentioned a while ago in our graph that there are 10 uh, mortality and morbidity in the country, the top leading causes of death. Now, if you look at the risk factors affecting health, health status, there are a lot of risk factors affecting with our, uh, our countrymen. No? So we have diabetes, the stroke, hypertension, which uh, have these risk factors uh, that are smoking for male, smoking for female, alcoholism, obesity, obesity for male and female, and physical inactivity for adults. The behavioral risk factors such as unhealthy diet, smoking, alcohol consumption, and sedentary lifestyle also promote non-communicable diseases according to the Department of Health in 2012 and other uh, sources and literatures. The increasing consumption then of items such as mentioned a while ago, such as saturated oils, fast food, uh, and sugar, coupled with decreased intake of carbohydrates, fruits, and vegetables, also contribute to the development of non-communicable diseases. That is according to ULEP et al. in 2013. Now let's move on to our... Uh, slide looking at with the total health expenditures in the country of selected uh, countries in 2014. So looking at the total health expenditure as of uh, the percentage of GDP, we say that the total health expenditure of the Philippines has consistently increased since 2005 and of course compare well with its neighbor like in Laos, Myanmar, Brunei, Darussalam, Indonesia, Thailand, and other Southeast Asian countries, 
wherein the government health expenditures has increased significantly in a nominal terms, but it has been eclipsed by the private funding sources, which have grown rapidly with the economy. So as you can see that even Japan has the highest in terms of the total health expenditures as of the percentage of GDP in 2014. So looking at this one, we have much of our total health expenditure is more into personal care, although the government has raised spending on public health since 2007. There are three major components of public health financing have overlapping coverage. The Department of Health funds regional and apex hospitals, whereas the local government units funds primarily and secondary level care and also the PhilHealth or the Philippine Health Insurance reimburse government as well as the private health facilities that is reportedly covers 92% of the population of which 40% of the poor population has been subsidized by the government for premium payments. So as we, as we all know that there is actually been a support by the government, but of course, there is still a high level of household no, um, payment, no, out of the pocket payment from the people no? in terms of payment in the hospital, in the payment of, the, of their medication no, in the local uh, community levels. Now, in the private health expenditure in the Philippines in billion in 2009 to 2014, you have, uh, it is very obvious as what I mentioned, the out of the pocket uh, payment from the people we mentioned that the proportion of the out of the uh, out of uh, payments, you know, out of the pocket payments from the people, you know, uh, of the total health expenditure is more than fifty percent has been historically very high. You know, this is according to the table that has been presented. You know, that uh, compared to the 15 to 30 percent that is seen in the emerging economies with successful and more equitable health financing strategies, like for example, Japan and other. So they already in the very developed uh, countries, uh, most of the expenditure in the hospital has been covered by the government in comparison in the Philippines, which is quite very high. Now, from 2009 of 182.4 billion, going from 2014, which is 326.8, and until now, there is an increasing trend of out of the pocket payment from the people. So it's quite very alarming. No? And uh, as we can see here in the slide, there is a composition of a household out of the pocket payment and which among the out of the pocket is being spent by the people. And as you can see that the highest is more on the medicine, no? pharmaceutical products no? that is spent in an average expenditure of 2191.9 no? in terms of the out of pocket payments in 2012. So in this case, we can see that there is an annual spending of medication, drugs, medical charges, dental charges, hospital room charges, and other medical goods and supplies other than a medical health services and of course contraceptives that uh, no, that been spent by people. No? Among components of the OOP or out of the pocket no, expenditure, as you can see in a particular table, no, as of this 64% and 29% are for the pharmaceutical products and nutraceuticals. No? Respectively, we can say that uh, hence there is a significant portion of OOP expenditure that may not be medically important and since most nutraceutical that are supplementary indeed most of this being sold aggressively in the market carry the FDA warning 
of low approved therapeutic claim. So you can see that most people are actually diverting their payments or their money towards herbal supplements rather than synthetic medications. So because the notion of behavior of the people is that they believe that nutraceuticals are actually good for them, no organic, or there's no uh, particular side effect associated with this particular drug. So they rather go on to some nutraceuticals in comparison to pharmaceutical synthetic uh, medication, which have been labeled by the FDA as no approved therapeutic claims. No? So as you can see in this BC slide, that most of the sick people actually go from outpatient services or inpatient uh, services. No? Wherein you can see in this slide on the outpatient uh, services, they, may, they have a lot of options. And the options are the following. It can also be going to the primary healthcare centers or the rural health units, or it can also be in the selected government hospitals, the private clinics or the outpatient department, or it can also be in the very uh, countryside, we have traditional healers. No? So in the rural units, you can see that uh, this highlighted, uh, no? the dark ones in the box, are actually out of the pocket. Okay, Out of the pocket. So the opportunity costs of this rural health units are quite lesser in comparison for selected government hospitals. But as we all know that in the rural health units, there are quite very um, you know, uh, lesser in terms of technology, medical supplies, no, pharmaceutical products that are in the rural health units in comparison with uh, hospital or selected government hospital units. You can see that in the OPD, there are actually higher out-of-the-pocket in comparison with rural health units. And if that would be in the private clinic or OPD, quite higher. No, especially if that would be for medicine, uh, opportunity costs, no, and of course, uh, for selected government hospital, that would be for laboratory and diagnostic. No? But then in terms of the traditional healer, mostly these are, all of it are out of the pocket, or, or perhaps it will be in kind, or some traditional healers don't actually accept with payment. So it depends upon the situation. No? So it may be risky in, in their part, but they don't have a choice because uh, most of our countrymen are actually in the poverty line. So it really matters on their uh, financing, wherein you can see in the outpatient, majority of it are actually in the out of the pocket. Now moving on, if you are sick and if you need to have medical care for secondary or tertiary hospitals. Then from the government hospital, you can see that there are lesser out of the pocket in comparison with private hospitals. You can see that mostly in the private hospital, uh, they have uh, majority are out of the pocket program. Uh, you need to spend out, no? unlike if that would be in the government hospital. So in the government hospital, because of uh, not only field health, but these are covered by the government, okay? Government in terms of professional fees, laboratory and diagnostics, no? uh, medicines, procedures, basic accommodation, but only those patients who are qualified, like, for example, the Philippine Health Insurance or those who are qualified for um, social worker. No? So these are been uh, with the government support, especially in the local mayors or the local government units. These are being covered, unlike if that to be for private hospitals. Now, moving on to the slide, it actually mentioned here that, uh, that uh, okay, these are the framework of universal health care in the Philippines. So as what mentioned a while ago about uh, out-of-the-pocket programs, we mentioned that um, there are actually a lot of programs from the government uh, moving on to the universal health care coverage by the government. 
This is actually to the issuance of Administrative Order Number 2010-0036, and that is Operating Strategy of the Universal Healthcare Coverage, or what we called as in Kalusugan Pangkalahatan or UHC or KP. So as mentioned, the basic uh, aim to achieve the universal health care and to ensure the equitable access to quality health care by all Filipinos is prioritizing these three strategic trusts. And that trusts are the following, which is number one, the financing risk protection through the expansion of enrollment and benefit delivery. Number two is that the improvement of access to the quality hospital and health care facilities and services. And lastly, number three is the attainment of the health-related Millennium Development Goals, including the non-communicable diseases and their health-related risk factors that is according to the Department of Health in 2010. So these are the three major program to assure the strategic trust by the government to have to move on to this universe, universal health care in the Philippines. And these are embedded actually with the basic fundamental, uh, fundamental programs by the government in health financing, service delivery, health regulation, human resource, health information, and governments for health. You know? So this is the main impact that we want to deliver to the public in terms of the better health outcomes, responsive health system, and equitable. Equity meaning, meaning that whether you are poor or rich, it, it is a service for the government to have a free health care to all the public, to all health consumers. No? And it must be sustainable in terms of health financing. As we, as we all know that um, most of our um, health financing is more on OOP no, rather than health financing, sustainable health financing by the government. Okay, So these are the basic foundations or fundamental programs by the government to assure these three main strategic trusts by the government. Okay, Moving on, as we all know that uh, these are in the during uh, pandemic, you no know, COVID nineteen, so the, a lot of people are actually panicking. And if you don't have money at this time, I think this will be a troublesome for all of us. No, that how do Filipinos do access their medicine? No? So that's the major question. How do Filipinos actually access their medicine uh, through the um, pharmacy, through the government hospital, hospital pharmacy, and mostly they buy their uh, their medicine. Uh, through the private retail drugstore, which can be found in the urban or rural communities. No? In the big cities, we all know that uh, there are drugstores that are chain drugstores that have a very high share in the market. No? So if you are an independent uh, drugstore, you know, in comparison with the chain drugs, so they have more share in comparison with independent uh, drug stores in the market. No? In municipalities, the local pharmacies uh, and the physicians operate the pharmacy. No? As we all know, in the rural areas, your, uh, maybe your wife or your husband may be a doctor. Then your wife or the husband may be a pharmacist no? in the local community. So sometimes uh, they, do need, they don't need to hire a pharmacist, but then because their family is brought up by pharmacists, then, of course, they operate these drug stores. At the barangay level, we have uh, the variety of uh, sari sari store, botika ng barangay, or the village pharmacies, and that may sell popular brands of analgesic and antiparetic over the counter. Some of the botika ng barangay, they also sell some prescription medications, and of course, for hypertensive, for diabetes. No? In 2011, as mentioned, that there are estimate of 32,000, more than 32,000 uh, retail outlets in the countries no? that have a majority of which are found in more densely or highly urban populated areas. That is according to Reyes et al. in 2011. But medicines are can be brought also from the hospital pharmacy, which can cater uh, inpatient 
and of course, these are quite very expensive in comparison with retail drug stores. So poor patients usually buy medication in public centers, Botika ng Banggay, Botika ng Bayan, as well as district and provincial hospitals. Okay? So, as we all know that uh, before pandemic, COVID-19, uh, we have this kind of issues about polio vaccines. No? Because in the Philippines, they're already positive. We already eradicate it for a couple of years, but it returned back again the uh, polio in the poliomyelitis in the Philippines it began in 1979 where in vaccines are available and provided for free by UNICEF and by 1990 as we all know the national coverage of the fully implement uh, immunized uh, children has risen from 70 to 80 and here comes eradication of poliomyelitis um, no during that time we're in uh, in the, now in 2020, it's already been, uh, you know, begun of its pandemic. Uh, it, you know, it's become, it's more increasing, no? increasing, not pandemic, but it's increasing. Uh, and then as the Philippine economy improved, the Department of Health actually began the purchase of its own supply of vaccines in the mid 1990s. So it's already been there in place by the government and the vaccines were, procured in bulk through a domestic or international tender so but then on uh, but then on as we all know that the government nowadays has already have its procurement process and it's already been uh, well throughout nationwide no? so that one and as we all know that there are a number of new cases for HIV uh, that is in 2015 there are almost 21 patients per day. But as of the moment, there are almost 32 patients per day have been, um, you know, have been uh, positive then for HIV throughout the Philippines. And there are um, quite increasing trend no? that from 1984 to 2017, it implies that there are almost 60,207 confirmed HIV cases that is mostly male and 6% uh, are actually female no? as reported by the Department of Health. No? As of the moment, we have 32 P uh, cases have a newly diagnosed per day from January to October 2019. So it's really increasing trend uh, in the Philippines. No? So there's really a demand in terms of antiretroviral agents in the Philippines. No? Thanks God that uh, according to the Department of Health that it is actually for free for patients who are living in HIV and AIDS. So next would be about the Philippine pharmaceutical industry uh, in the national distribution. So as you can see that there are mostly chain pharmacies are quite uh, higher in comparison with uh, independent pharmacies or private hospital and government hospitals, even clinics and non-government organizations who are doing medical missions no? uh, and also uh, government agencies. No? So it's quite a lot of distributions of medications throughout. And uh, as we all know, there are monopolistic uh, pricing existing in the hospital drug sales, especially in private hospital where in the double no, their uh, prices no, were in out of the uh, hospital purchases are actually discouraged no, because uh, as we all know in the hospital setting that uh, once you already have uh, fulfilled all, you know, filled already your field health or Philippine health insurance, you know, because it has a particular percentage only of the coverage, uh, you need to buy your medication actually outside. Or they really encourage it to buy it uh, inside the hospital. You know? So it depends upon the coverage that you have in the hospital setting. But it's quite higher in comparison to the retail drug stores. So this slide actually mentioned about the 20, uh, top 20 share of therapeutic classes. And as we all know that uh, most of it are actually in the like infant milk, antihypertensive medication has its own share based on therapeutic classes or segments. 
and anti-infective is quite high, 10.9%. We have also narcotic uh, analgesic. We have also anti-ulcerants, cold preparation, 1.9%. But the bigger chunk is actually moving into the infant milk and other general nutritional products. Some of it are actually multivitamins and from vitamin C and multivitamins that are available in the market. Okay. So this quite very high chunk for uh, for some of the products that we have. Okay. So and other top ten ethical prescription brands in the Philippines, moving from annual total from uh, September uh, that is in billion. No? So we have Norvas from Pricer for hypertension. Uh, the generic name is Amlodipine. That's twenty four point three uh, billion. Quite high. We have Ventolin also for asthma. Uh, the generic name is Albuterol. Plavix from Sanofi Adventis uh, from thrombosis. That is uh, for clopidogrel bisulfate. And also Augmentin Glaxo from uh, GlaxoSmithKline for infectious uh, antibiotic. Neoblack for hypertension. Uh, the generic name is Metropolol. Lipitor is quite very familiar, uh, familiar to you. Uh, these are generated by Fr Pricer, okay? These are, and also uh, Wyatt from Ta Tazuxin, Sejen United American Laboratories. Uh, we have also Plendil from AstraZeneca. We have also Glaxo SK from, uh, from this as asthma um, drug. We have Seritai, which are quite very famous for asthmatic patients. We have a combination of floticazole and sanmeterol. So these are very common ethical or prescription drugs available in the market. We have also uh, here that is a top 10 brands. And one of it, the number one product is actually a multivitamin, a vitamin supplement called Celine by Pediatrica uh, that earns 6.1%. Uh, okay, 6.1 billion. And Sol Milk's West Month, that is for cough. Nailsep, I think it's quite very familiar. Okay, very famous product. We have Biogesic, Enervon C, Alaxan, Myra E, Senecal, Centrum, and Cherifer. So these are quite very famous. And most of it, this product are, are actually vitamin supplements that are quite very famous over-the-counter medication brands in the Philippines. Okay. So these are fast-moving products, as we all know, in the market. Okay? So uh, what are then the requirements then for registration? As we all know, there are very tedious um, what you call, uh, requirements in terms of registra registering your products. And that is if you want to go on an ASEAN level or maybe in the, in the international level, you need to follow then on the common technical dos dossier, no? dossier in terms of a particular country. And if that would be in ASEAN, you need to follow then with ACPD, or what we call as ASEAN Common Technical Dossier. No? So which are adopted then by different countries then, like implemented in Malaysia in July 2000, uh, 2000, um, okay? 2000. So you can see here that in 2003, in July, it's been implemented in Malaysia. So once you actually have uh, a um, register for this particular product, then you need to have the common administrative data and product information then uh, before you're going to move on to your um, different registration. You need to know also in terms of the requirements then for quality, non-clinical and clinical aspect then that's one of the requirements then for ASEAN common technical dossier no? so you need to have all these requirements tedious requirements then um, not only with the clinical but also non-clinical aspects then of your product no? from the bioavailability then to the stability of your product then no? and all those technicalities, including the label of your product. So this is part of the requirements of registration. So moving on to other countries, then they have their own requirement. So we have this ASEAN Common Technical Dossier to actually guide us what are then the requirements of each and every countries. 
that are within ASEAN countries. And if you go to the European and of course American uh, countries and even Japan, they have their own requirements then that you need to follow. Okay, so that's uh, some of the requirements. There's some of the major local companies that import pharmaceuticals in the Philippines, like Aeon Pharmatech, Aspen Philippines, Philippine Pharmacy Procurement, Casric Pharma, Raquel Abres, and all of this are these major local companies that import uh, pharmaceuticals in the country. Okay, so take note of that. So these are the top 20 leading pharmaceutical companies. We have the uh, United Laboratories are Filipino uh, local companies in the Philippines. We have the Pfizer, the multinational companies, GlaxoSmith, the GSK, Abbott Lab, Novartis, uh, Borinder, uh, Engelheim, Sanofi Aventis. We have also Johnson & Johnson and of course, of course, AstraZeneca. So these are some of the very common leading uh, pharmaceutical company in the country. So moving on, so these are the top 10 and number one is actually uh, Pfizer in the multinational company. So, uh, and of course, Roach, Johnson & Johnson. So uh, according to the total avenue from pharmaceutical segment in USD, there's a greater, uh, shall we say, as you go along to the ladder, Pfizer has a great uh, in terms of its um, revenue then for pharmaceutical segment, okay? So it is quite at the top. Pfizer is one of the top. Roach, Johnson & Johnson, Sanofi, Merck also, Novartis, uh, Avive, Amgen, GSK still there, and of course, Bristol Myers Squibb, okay? So in terms of the manufacturer's markup of pharma goods, you can see that there's a greater markup in terms of manufacturing for original products and, of course, for generic brands. Okay, you can see that uh, the originator brand, they have a manufacturer selling price up to 65 to 75% of its final selling price. Well, if that would be in terms of generic brands, we have 33% of the final selling price and also with the manufacturer selling price for generic brands. So it's quite a higher markup for generic brands in comparison if that would be for uh, originators. But sometimes we have for retail, it's quite higher also you know, in terms of markup for generic brands in comparison with originator brands. Okay. So for generic brands also, they have different from duties, retail markup, and of course, wholesaler margins may have different sets in terms of its uh, percentage of markup no? according to Health Action International Philippines Components of Medicine uh, Prices. Now, moving on with this, you can see that the retail markup for pharma goods would be in Butike ng Barangay or Butike ng Bayan. You can see that there is a markup of 25 to 335% according to regulations. There would be 30%. No? Then, that would be for generic brands, okay? For generic brands for public hospital, that would be 10 to 25%. And if that would be for chain pharmacy, it may have differences in terms of its percentage. And if that would be for originator brands, that would be for, uh, like example, for independent drugstore, that would be 4 to, 4 to 6 to 8%. And if that would be for private drugstore, then that would be 2.8 to 6.5%, no? That would be differences in terms of where it is, like chain pharmacy, public pharmacy, or public uh, hospitals. Now, moving on with this, uh, let's try to spot the differences between this particular brands. No? So in India, there are, in Smith Climb, Beckham, for amoxicillin, it's only 10 US dollars for 250 milligrams for 100 tablets of amoxil. Well, if that would be in the Philippine setting, then there will be an increase of more than 19 US dollars. So that will be a spot the difference then for India and the Philippines. Quite very high when we look at the Amoxil then for branded name in generic products here in the Philippines. In comparison with other ASEAN countries or Southeast Asian countries, we may say that the Philippines are quite higher in terms of pricing 
for pharmaceutical product in comparison with India and other Southeast Asian countries. And one of the examples then for a Santac, for a Glaxo, uh, in 150 milligram or 100 tablets, it is only three US dollars for India. Well, in fact, in Philippines, there are almost more than 100 to 500 percent in terms of increase in comparison of that to be in India. So it's quite higher. Huh? If you go onto other countries buying their medications, you can see people that they buy their medication per boxes. In comparison of that in the Philippines, we only buy it by tablets. You know? So it's quite very sad to look at these differences. Now, moving on to the share of foreign local per, uh, per TC in pesos, we can see that there are um, very few local uh, pharmaceutical companies that have a share in comparison if that would be for uh, foreign pharmaceutical industries or pharmaceutical sectors. They already manipulated the market in comparison for those local markets that we have. No? So in COVID-19 pandemic, usually um, there are a lot of companies have actually going to the development of this product. And one of it are your Abbott, AstraZeneca, Bayer, Bonheimer, Ingelheim, GlaxoSmith, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Novartis, Pricer, Roach, Sanofi, and of course, Takeda. So I think uh, you have already heard uh, some of uh, this pharmaceutical products that are actually developing nowadays you know, for COVID-19 pandemic. No? So that is according to the Pharmaceutical and Healthcare Association of the Philippines in one uh, in nation with the fight against COVID-19 pandemic. Now moving on that we are actually in the race of, of this COVID-19 pandemic as extra for you that there are some pharmaceutical products that are developing nowadays. Like for example, for viral sector uh, vaccines, we have already mentioned that uh, this pharma uh, this pharmaceutical products are divided into two. We have replicating viral vectors. These are examples of a weekend uh, missiles now that are, like for example, also your Ebola vaccines. Uh, these are actually viral vector vaccines that are that are replicated within the cells. Some of the pharmaceutical products like Johnson & Johnson, Gaia Vax, and others are actually formulating uh, this June 2020 for COVID-19 vaccines. No? And others are actually within viral vector vaccine. We have non-replicating viral vectors such as your adenovirus as one of the examples. No? Uh, that are actually developed for this non-replicating viral sectors, which uh, as of the moment, there is no licensed vaccines used in this kind of method. Now we move on to another vaccine. We call it DNA vaccine. This have at least 20 uh, teams actually been using genetic instructions in a form of an RNA or DNA for coronavirus, no? coronavirus proteins that prompts an immune system. So some of the pharmaceutical companies, such as you know, biopharmaceuticals with some China uh, pharmaceuticals like Beijing and vaccine, um, those are actually estimated to have this trial on April 2020. We have also another one, we have RNA vaccine, as what I have mentioned, some of the pharmaceuticals like uh, CureVac, Moderna, which are quite very famous, and the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases that have the first trial run on March 2020. Now, we move on to another vaccine. We have live attenuated vaccine, which are actually using lab LAV technology. Now, some of the examples that uses LAV technology or live attenuated vaccine are your missiles, rotavirus, BCG, no, and yellow vaccines that are quite very common in the market. Some of the pharmaceutical companies like Podagenics with Serum Institute of India are developing this in August 2020. Now, moving on, we have protein-based vaccine. Some of the pharmaceutical products like uh, Novavax, Clover Biopharmaceuticals, and GSK are moving into 
uh, this uh, COVID-19 vaccines no, estimated uh, the first human trial would be on June 2020 and some others like immune response that are quite common in the market. Now, this needs to be answered by all of you. So this will be discussed throughout our activity on what would be the best solution in terms of the healthcare system in the Philippines and how does the pharmaceutical industry cope up with this pandemic and based on the presentation, how, and how can you define pharmaceutical marketing then? So that will be discussed in our class. Now, in the take-home message, we all know that the healthcare system in the Philippines is still fragmented and very complex because we have a lot of OOP out of the pocket that are health financed by the people. No? And a lot of people still having out of the pocket financing on health, risk factors are increasing, leading to non-communicable and communicable diseases. And pharmaceutical industries in the Philippines are expanding from a local to a multinational companies investing in the country because we have a very good economy nowadays, no? amidst this COVID-19 pandemic. No? And the great markup and still some of the people cannot still afford, even though we have a lot of multinational companies, local markets still that have its own innovator and generic product, but still people cannot afford no? based, on their lifestyle, based on the lifestyle medications that they have for hypertension, diabetes, and others. No? And lastly, in this COVID-19 crisis, pharmaceuticals are in the race towards ultimate treatment no, for this COVID-19 pandemic. Okay? So as we all know, these are my references. And thank you very much for this opportunity to have with you in this topic number one about healthcare system in the Philippines and the pharmaceutical industry that we have in the country. So thank you very much. I am Dr. Erwin martinez Palier. I am your professor from San Pedro College Pharmacy Department. Don't forget to like and subscribe in my YouTube channel, Dr. Erwin Palier. Thank you very much.